right. So how about we start by saying uh, Hail Mary, okay? All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Faustina, St. John Paul II, Pray for us. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, so before I do start, though, please do, um, I know a lot of people know me because of my conversion story, um, but don't forget about the other books. <laughs> Everybody's like, wow, Father, your story. I'm like, yeah, I'm glad you read that book, but I've got like eight more. Um, <laughs> so this is the latest one. It's intimidating. It's a huge book. Uh, but it's really, really good. I, I mean, I, I, you know, it sounds arrogant because it's my book, but, I, you know, I don't know how an author doesn't promote his own stuff, you know. So please get a copy of that. And then also, we just put out these. These are brand new, hot off the press. I mean, smoking hot, right? Three ninety nine for these little things. They're, they're small enough to fit in your purse or a back pocket, but they're powerful enough to save a soul. It's how to pray the rosary. Um, and, you know, we want these to go into parishes, the pews, to hospitals, to seminaries, to prisons, all over the place. And they're so, it's such a nice little booklet. So we're, we've got these as well. And then also, and I'm sorry to make plugs for this at the beginning, but if I don't, you're only going to remember my conversion book. I, okay. For this special anniversary of Fatima, the 100th centennial anniversary, right? A new DVD, Mary 101. Really good stuff. Okay. Got that there. And then these. I call these my, my Catholic version of a Harley Davidson biker shirt. <laughs> They're really cool. We should actually get these leather for like guys with beards and <laughs> ponytails. So it's got that shield image on the back. They're coming men's and in women's. They're really nice. So, you know, my mom is sporting this thing all around the place now. It's so funny. My mom looks like a little biker now, you know. Okay. All right. So let me get started on this talk because what I'm going to talk about um, is just a sampling from what's in the book, almost nothing at all because there's so much in here. And I want to focus on, of course, the rosary, um, Our Lady's Call from Fatima as well, and St. Faustina because, you know, we're here for Divine Mercy Sunday weekend, but it's also a very important year for the Fatima apparitions, you know, 100 years. That's, that's huge. Um, who knows if the sun's going to spin or something next month or in October, but I'm kind of praying it does. We need a wake-up call, you know, in the world. Uh, so spin it, Lord. You know, yo-yo the sun. Yo-yo it, you know. <laughs> do what you got to do to get our attention, you know. Okay, so I just need to give you a brief, um, since I'm so, my mind is so on the rosary these days, I'm traveling constantly giving talks about the rosary. So I want to start with that because everything with the rosary kind of crescendos, um, in the last century and even in our current times. But you might need to know a little bit about the history of the rosary. So um, where does the rosary come from? Well, in the 13th century, so 800 years ago, there was a priest in uh, France, but he was originally from Spain, Dominic Guzman, St. Dominic. And he was up against this terrible heresy at the time that were going against Christianity and all the truths of Christianity. And he, as the tradition says, was given this powerful form of prayer to go against falsehoods. So it was understood from the very beginning to be a spiritual weapon. And he used it to bring people back who were in this, this heresy called Albigensianism. And if I use a lot of words you don't know or not familiar with, just get the book. It's all in the book. Um, so I'm, I'm still plugging the book. So, um, But he, he, he did so much good and brought so many people back. But Satan, you know, did not like this. Satan never does. And tried to destroy it. So just a century after St. Dominic was given the rosary, the Black Plague hit Europe and killed one-third of the population of Europe. We're talking millions and millions of people died. And even documents were burned on the rosary. Satan does this all the time. He tries to burn sources of new devotion to God and Our Lady, which, remember, he even did with St. Faustina's diary. Remember the first version? You know, she was tricked by the evil one to burning the first, you know, version of it, what she had began to write. Okay, the devil does that. He wants to burn these things to get rid of them because they're going to bring about so much good. And then there were other times when the rosary would be used. Heaven would speak to us, still does, in apparitions or through popes, you know, the vicar of Christ on earth, or through saints, telling us about the importance of the rosary when we need it. I mean, we always need it. But there are certain times throughout history when we really need to focus upon the sacred mysteries of Jesus Christ, because we forget and we go astray. So, 
you will have tons of, every century will have times when you will have saints who will champion it and who will be raised up, you know, and, and, and te be telling people, we need to turn back to the rosary. We've forgotten this. Or you'll get popes who will do this. And there have been so many popes who, who have championed the rosary. I mean, think about the 16th century when Christianity was divided because of Protestantism, right? You had, you had a, sadly, a priest, Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism, who fell away from the Catholic Church and did so much damage. And many of them abandoned the rosary. But then you had a holy pope who said, we need to pray this. And he realized that uh, radical Islam wanted to take over Christianity. Because Christianity was now divided, because you had the Catholics and the Protestants, and there was, wasn't unity. And so Islam, and this powerful Ottoman Empire, it was called at the time, Muslim Turks, wanted to conquer Christianity. But the Pope promoted the rosary. And so we have basically the saving of Western civilization and the saving of the church in a real way. Uh, a lot of people don't know about this today. They've forgotten. Right? The devil sometimes wants us to forget these lessons from history. But it, it shows us the importance. And so many other instances during the French Revolution, uh, instances in so many countries. Many of you, I've met you coming in, and we took pictures and signing books. Uh, I was hoping to make it to the front at some point to give this talk. Um, <laughs> you know, your culture, if you dig into your culture, I almost guarantee you that probably your country or some aspect of your culture was saved because of the rosary. If you're Filipino, if you're from South America, if you're you know, Latino, basically, in, of any kind, pretty much all Asians at some point, the rosary has played a major role in saving your culture and your country from political ideologies, from some crazy regime that wants to take over and, and bring communism or socialism or whatever it is you know, into that country. Just look into your history, and you'll find the rosary there. I pretty much guarantee you. Now... In this history, which is 800 years, and as I said, I don't have the time to go into the whole thing, so many things happen that I want to bring you just kind of, we're going to go from the 13th century to right up until the beginning of the 20th century. Because that's when things start to get really serious. So serious that God wants to show us the power of the rosary before Fatima happens, and before St. Faustina comes on the scene, and before John Paul II. Now, what do I mean specifically? Well... We're going to have a pope at that time, so a little over 100 years ago, named Leo XIII. How many of you have heard about Pope Leo XIII? Oh, so many of you. That's awesome. I love this guy. Why this man is not a saint blows my mind. You know, I'm like, canonize that guy already, you know? <laughs> Just like Fulton Sheen, I'm like, canonize that man, you know? So Pope Leo XIII, he was, uh, you know, the pope who transitioned from the 19th century into the 20th century, and he wrote 11 encyclicals on the rosary. Do you believe that? Now, an encyclical is like a super important letter that the Pope writes. Super important. It's almost like, you know, you couldn't get any higher of an importance. 11 of those received, you know, mystical experiences about the rosary, was given the St. Michael prayer, was told by heaven, you know, that he, 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 he heard this battle taking place between St. Michael the archangel and the evil angels, and that there would be a period of 100 years where Satan would try to destroy the church. And this pope was just on fire with love for the rosary, on fire with love for it. Also during his time, heaven was trying to speak to us to show us the power that the rosary has. A, an ordained satanic priest had a conversion through the rosary, and now built the world's most famous shrine to the rosary in Pompeii, Italy. Have any of you ever been there to the shrine of Our Lady of the Rosary in Pompeii? It is unbelievable. It's one of the most beautiful churches you will ever see in your life, I guarantee it. When I walked in there, I couldn't believe what my eyes were seeing. It's so gorgeous. Founded by a former satanic priest. Now that guy's name is Blessed Bartolo Longo. He's a blessed of the church. Do you remember that letter in 2002 that um, St. John Paul put out on the rosary where we got the luminous mysteries. Do you remember that? He kept mentioning this guy in there that I have to confess at the time I didn't know. He kept mentioning Blessed Bartolo Longo. And I was like, who is this guy? I've never heard of this guy. Cool name, right? Sounds uh, Bartolo Longo. Hey, yeah. it sounds mafia, you know? But I'm like, who's this guy? So I did some research and I was like, wait a minute. Uh, this guy was an ordained satanic priest? What? Like, why do, am I not aware of this? And I, I started asking people, even priests, have you heard of this Bartolo Longo guy? And they're like, never heard of him. I said, what's this incredible? 
So heaven was trying to tell us really important things through having an ordained satanic priest have a radical conversion, built the world's most famous shrine to the rosary, and a pope who would write 11 encyclicals on the rosary. Why all of that? Well, because the 20th century was going to be chaos. It was going to experience more war and more death from wars than any other time in human history. There was going to be so many bad things happen so quickly in the 20th century that we were going to need the power of the rosary and even new forms of devotion on ordinary rosary beads that would, that would come into play. And, and this is what God would do in a powerful way. You know, think about it. In, in, when Our Lady came to Fatima, she came to the children, which they kind of knew the rosary, but they kind of cheated. You ever hear those stories about them? I love these little kids. They'd go out with their sheep, and they, they, they wanted to play. So they would pray a rosary, but they would just go, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. You can do a rosary like that in about 45 seconds, you know, and then you play. The kids, got to love them. So, you know, they were familiar with it, but Our Lady came uh, to really focus upon this message. You know, there are many aspects to the Fatima message, which Father Chris is going to talk about in his talk. But what I want to emphasize is that the Fatima apparitions are basically rosary apparitions because Our Lady really emphasizes the importance of this. At one point, um, uh, somebody asked the visionaries, what is the most important aspect that Our Lady emphasizes in her messages? Do you know what they said? The daily rosary. That's what she put the emphasis on. And she was telling them that this has so much power that it can stop wars. World War I was happening at that time, and she said, if, by praying it, you can stop wars. Now, that's powerful, my friends. You know, a lot of people, they, they look at this and they think, well, that's something that, you know, people do at funerals and, you know, for, for old ladies at, at church. No. Remember, this actually was first given to a man, to St. Dominic. So this is very important for us to, to remember that this is a spiritual weapon and, and that it has power. And so... Every, before every apparition, the children would pray the rosary and all the other people would, would gather in and Our Lady, you know, have a rosary wrapped around her hand and emphasizing the importance of this. So much so that what happened at the last apparition, right? We, we call the Fatima apparitions Our Lady of Fatima. But what did Our Lady call herself on October 13th, 1917? <laughs> the Lady of the Rosary, right? And then God spun the sun like a yo-yo, you know, in front of the people. But that's interesting, because remember, uh, well, maybe you don't know this. It's in, it's in the book, though. When, when Our Lady gave the rosary to St. Dominic in the 13th century, the tradition says that the sun spun. You may not know that history, and not a lot of people do, but it's recorded you know, in, in the last 800 years of, of the tradition. So heaven is trying to speak to us about the importance of this because of the crazy things that would begin to take place in the 20th century. And I want to mention some of these, these, these aspects because I don't, sometimes I think we forget or maybe we, we, we haven't known these things because, you know, sometimes we associate the Fatima message just with 1917, but that's not the case. You know, Sister Lucia, who, by the way, hopefully will be a saint too, I always feel like she got left out, you know. She's like, what about me? Yo, I, I lived down here for like 97 years, you know. <laughs> She was the victim, you know. She's the one who had to deal with this fallen tears, you know, place. So after the, the little blessed soon-to-be saints, Francisco and Jacinta, died, you know, Sister Lucia became a nun, and she at one point was living in Spain, and in 1925, Our Lady appeared to her and, and said this to her, okay? And this is part of what we understand to be the Fatima event, you know, in its totality. Our Lady said this, Look, my daughter, at my heart encircled by these thorns with which men pierce it at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. You, at least, strive to console me, and so I announce, I promise, to assist at the hour of death with the grace necessary for salvation all those who, with the intention of making reparation to me on the first Saturday of five consecutive months, go to confession, receive Holy Communion, say five decades of the rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the mysteries of the rosary. Once again, emphasizing the rosary. Do you know that Our Lady actually told Sister Lucia that she needed to learn how to read and write so that she could write down her memoirs and promote the rosary? 
Sister Lucia didn't even know how to read and write. A lot of people didn't back at that time, but heaven asked her to learn that so that she could promote the rosary, and she did. Now, after this experience, Sister Lucia and others were wondering, why five for Saturdays? Why not six? Why not seven? That's a biblical number, right? Eight, even. Why not, you know? Well, heaven answered that. When, in 1930, Jesus appeared to uh, Sister Lucia and told her that it was to uh, make reparation for the following things. Now, this is really important. This is really important. i got to find it here. It's in this little, oh, i got a little booklet on it here, a little pamphlet on it, too. I <laughs> plug another thing here. These are a dime a dozen, by the way. You can get a million of these things. It's in here somewhere. But our Lord says this. It was these five things. This is why five first Saturdays. For the blasphemies against the Immaculate Conception, for blasphemies against Mary's virginity, for blasphemies against the divine maternity, that Mary is the mother of God, for those who publicly implant in children's hearts indifference, contempt, and even hatred against Mary, and then the fifth, for those who directly insult her sacred images. This was in 1930 when Jesus said this to Sister Lucia. Imagine what would happen, you know, during that time where all these things were taking place. Let me just show you, because they're happening now. Do you know when Our Lady was, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception was declared in 1854, right? So before Fatima, but the Immaculate Conception made a dogma in 1854. Do you know what happened in 1855? The invention of synthetic rubber. Satan brought about what we today call, and I hate to even say the word, I won't say the word. You know what it is. Satan invented something to prevent contraception in 1855, the year after the church declared the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Satan came up with a device to prevent conception. Whoa. There were going to be blasphemies against the Immaculate Conception, beginning in the previous century and coming into the last century and even today, all over the place. You see this. You hear it. Blasphemies against Mary's virginity. All you got to do today is turn on the TV. All you got to do is take notice of, and I'm not condemning anybody but when I say this, but some of the most major players of our times have been using Our Lady's name, the Madonna, Lady Gaga. Hmm, interesting. Are we not, if we pray, we pick up on these things. Satan is using people and what they do to basically blaspheme the Madonna, our Lady, through these things, foul, disgusting things, not chaste and modest, against Mary, ultimately, virginity. And we, we entertain ourselves with this nonsense today. It's how filthy and sick we become. This is why our Lord appeared to her and said, these are why five Saturdays. Blasphemies against the divine maternity. You know, I, I tell you, I'm seeing this more and more, more and more. You know, people take the name of our Lord in vain, which is wrong, of course. But, you know, sometimes I turn on TV, which is almost always a mistake, and I, I'm watching a sitcom, and you know what they're doing now? They're using the name of Our Lady in vain. Blasphemies against her divine maternity. What are they saying? And I'm going to say it in a reverential way, but they don't mean it in a reverential way. They will say, Mother of God. That's a blasphemy against the divine maternity of Our Lady. And they're saying it now in the media all the time. I hear it. I'm sure you've heard it too. The fourth aspect, right? Those who publicly implant in children's hearts, children, indifference, contempt, and even hatred against Mary. That's happened as well. All over the place, that's happened. Sometimes people, you know, are, are telling their children that Mary is of no consequence to the Christian life, that she's of no importance whatsoever. The fifth aspect, and this one really breaks my heart, those who directly insult her sacred images. When's the last time you went to a modern art museum? Ugh, right? What is that stuff, you know? Some crazy stuff going on in there where they literally do things with statues and images of Our Lady that are so sick and disgusting, and they call it art. They call it art. You know, in Estonia, you probably heard about this in the media, two years ago, just two years ago, the first thing that you did when you walked into this modern art museum was to kick and destroy a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Do you remember that in the media? Just two years ago in Estonia. So you, they, they had it like in a hologram. And so the first thing, you, you, to get in, you got your ticket, and then you kicked this, and it sent Our Lady statue spinning, and then it shattered. That was required to get into the museum. 
It's crazy what's going on today. That was this, our Lord said these things in 1930. All the things that would happen after that are just, we know, they're horrible. And you know, it's almost as though we, we've forgotten about these five first Saturdays and making reparation to Our Lady's heart and the emphasis on the rosary that heaven began to speak to us again. So we get the calls from Fatima, and, and you know, many people did respond, but many did not. But heaven kept speaking to us, trying to get our attention. So what did heaven do? Gave us apparition after apparition after apparition, emphasizing the rosary and the seriousness of the times. So during the same time that our Lord would be giving St. Faustina, you know, her messages, we also had Bano and Burang approved uh, in 1932 and 1933, where Our Lady came with the rosary. And during the same time, St. Faustina's apparitions and messages, which once again, you know, a new form of devotion given to the world is going to be given on ordinary rosary beads, ordinary rosary beads, almost because we kind of didn't really pay enough attention to Fatima. For example, do you remember what happened in 1916 when the, angels, the angel came to the children? Father Chris might talk about that more. I know he emphasizes that a lot. It's really important because in 1916, um, an angel came to the little children and taught them certain prayers. The angel of peace prayer from Fatima. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore thee profoundly, and I offer thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifferences whereby he is offended. And there's a, there's a little bit more, but doesn't that sound familiar? Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, right? So it's like heaven is saying to us, okay, look, you guys are so weak right now that you're not even spending 20 minutes in prayer on the rosary. I'm going to give you something that takes five. Give me five minutes, okay? This, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, it's like the rosary on training wheels, you know? <laughs> Heaven is begging. It's like, cooperate with me. Five minutes, okay? Focus. You know, that's how merciful God is to us with these messages to us. And he, they keep hammering the, these messages to us and, and speaking to us through, you know, uh, these apparitions. And not a lot of people know this, but, you know, the power of this prayer is so important because every day on this planet, you know, there are approximately 150 to 200,000 people who die every day. We're not aware of that. We hear an ambulance coming down the road. We throw out a Hail Mary, which is a good practice to do, right? But every day, almost 200,000 people die on this planet. And so many of them are not prepared for death. They're not ready for death. And so what does our Lord say about the power of the chaplet of mercy? You, you know this, I think. I'm probably telling this to the choir here. But let me remind you of the promises. This is from the lips of our Savior. The souls that say this chaplet will be embraced by my mercy during their lifetime and especially at the hour of their death. At the hour of their death, I defend as my own glory every soul that will recite this chaplet. Or when others say it for a dying person, the pardon is the same. When they say this chaplet in the presence of the dying, I will stand between my father and the dying person, not as a just judge, but as the merciful Savior. When this chaplet is said at the bedside of a dying person, unfathomable mercy envelops the soul, and the very depths of my tender mercy are moved for the sake of the sorrowful passion of my son. And priests will recommend the chaplet to sinners as their last hope of salvation. Wow, what a gift we have in, in, in this bless, these blessed beads. And heaven is constantly reminding us of this. After the apparitions of, of our, our Lady uh, and our Lord to St. Faustina and all these gifts that we've been given, heaven continued to speak, right? We have Our Lady of Akita, 1973. Coapa, basically Our Lady of the Rosary in Nicaragua. Almost nobody knows about that one, but it's approved. The rosary was the main emphasis. Cabejo, you've heard of Cabejo, right? Our Lady Cabejo. Our Lady came to tell them about the rosary and another ancient form of the rosary, the Seven Sorrows Rosary. Very important, right? Then you have San Nicolas, Argentina, just fully approved, I think it was last year. The visionary is still living and the messages up to that point are approved at that point. And then God raised up great apostles of the rosary to remind us of this so we don't forget. Fulton Sheen, right? 
Patrick Payton, how many of you heard of Patrick Payton? Father Patrick Payton, oh, what a guy, right? The rosary priest of the 20th century, so amazing. And then St. John Paul II. You know what St. John Paul II did? He basically resharpened the ancient blade of the sword of the rosary and made it into a modern-day light saber by giving us the luminous mysteries. And, you know, it's funny because every now and then I meet people who are resistant to the luminous mysteries, and they're like, oh, I don't pray that. That's a post-Vatican II thing. Nah, I'm not into it. Mm. St. Louis de Montfort promoted four of the current five luminous mysteries. It's just that he didn't call them the luminous mysteries. It was actually a priest pre-Vatican II named St. George Preca, who's now a saint, from Malta, St. George Preca, he invented the luminous mysteries. He called them the mysteries of light. John Paul II simply said they're called the luminous mysteries. So they're pre-Vatican II for sure. Why these mysteries? On ordinary beads. To combat the falsehoods of our time and to console the hearts of Jesus and Mary. Think about it. The mysteries that were given to St. Dominic 800 years ago combated those who were attacking the, the mysteries of Christianity when it came to the Incarnation. When it came to the passion of Jesus and his resurrection, they denied those things. So heaven gave the mysteries to St. Dominic. Today, what are people denying? Baptism. So many people don't think about that, right? Think about my story. If you remember my story, I wasn't baptized until I was 10, and I wasn't even baptized in the Catholic Church. So many people today don't baptize their children. So we get these mysteries that we've forgotten that we need to get back to. Marriage. I mean, today you've got people trying to marry anything. <laughs> I mean it. It's weird. We're nuts. A couple years ago, a lady, civilly and even legally in England, married her dolphin, guys. Yeah. I mean, we're nuts. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's insane. But then you've got, you know, Tom trying to marry Larry. It's insane what's going on today. At the wedding feast of Cana, it was one man and one woman. Very clear. So when you pray that decade, you're reminded of marriage, and you are, in a real sense, consoling the heart of Jesus and Mary because they're not happy. It doesn't please their heart by some of the crazy things that we're doing today. People today don't think that they need conversion. They think that Jesus is just another guru, that, that he's like Zen Buddhism. Everybody's into Zen today, and this, that, and the other, you know, or, or, or part of Buddha or, or whatever, that Jesus is on the same level as Muhammad. Mm, wrong. <laughs> Very wrong. Jesus is God, and we need conversion in Jesus Christ. There's no other way to the Father. He said that. What about the, the fourth luminous mystery, the transfiguration, right? He's not just a guru. He's not just some prophet. He is the God-man. He is the Savior of the world. And then the Eucharist. You know what's so sad today? So many Catholics don't believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. They don't. Remember, all this is crescendoing. Remember that prayer that I just read? For all the offenses and all the tabernacles around the world, our Lord is not being correctly genuflected to. He's not being acknowledged. Sometimes in churches, the tabernacle is down the hallway, not in, even in the sanctuary. Mm, this is not pleasing to heaven. We've got to get this stuff back. Heaven is hammering these issues with us. And in a certain way, we've, we're crescendoing right now. We're in the centennial anniversary of the Fatima apparitions. That's why I, my prayer to God is this, and this is bold. Uh, and I know this is being recorded, so I, I might be a martyr after this if certain people hear this. <laughs> My prayer is that either next month, when the Pope is in Fatima, or October 13th, whatever, spin that sun, God. <laughs> spin it. Wake us all up. We need it in our times. We need something serious. My prayer also is this, and this is bold. This is where I might be martyred. I pray that Our Lady, because there's a deep connection with Our Lady of Fatima and, and Islam, Right? Fatima was one of the daughters of Muhammad. And so there's, there's a reason here. Fulton Sheen talked about this. That Can you imagine if so many Muslims had a mass conversion? Just like, remember in the 16th century when Our Lady went to Mexico? right? When so many people were leaving the true church in Europe, the Catholic church, because of the Protestant you know, rebellion, Our Lady filled in the gap. Eight to ten million people. Converted to Catholicism in the matter of like a decade, a massive conversion. The Aztec, you know, false gods were crushed, and Mexico became Catholic. Can you imagine today if there was a worldwide mass conversion of Muslims to Catholicism? See, they already pray seven times a day. All we got to do is basically say, yeah, you've been doing it wrong. Here's the breviary, right? <laughs> really? They already got something that actually looks just like this. Minus the crucifix, but they got beads and they invoke the divine names. Can you imagine if there was a worldwide conversion of Muslims? Do you know what I pray for? This is bold, I know it's bold, but that's just me. Blessed Mother, 
have an apparition on top of Mecca. <laughs> Stand on top of that black box thing that they all go to and say to them, like you said in, 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 in apparitions after 1917, when Our Lady appeared and it said, grace is in mercy, right? Appear on top of that black box in Mexa, Mecca and have it say under you, do whatever he tells you. The true God, right, to Jesus Christ. Can you imagine if something like that happened? Oh, my goodness. I pray for it. I really do. I really do. And we need to be praying this more and more for every need that we have. This is the call from Fatima. This is, in many ways, an essential part of the divine mercy message. St. Faustina loved the rosary. She did. She prayed it all the time. All the time. All saints do, by the way. Really, if you want to grow in virtue, if you want to see change in your life and in your family, pray the rosary. It packs so much power in it that most people are not aware of it. They do. They just think that, well, I hang it from my rearview mirror of my car. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But take it off every now and then and pray it, you know? <laughs> Fulton Sheen I love, he actually says that even if you, you, you can't uh, pray the rosary physically, God has, you know, set it up so we get 10 digits you know, you, there's no excuse for you, okay? Really, there's no excuse. He actually used to say this. We don't have these anymore. I kind of wish we did. Actually, there is a guy making these in Iowa. It blew my mind. Fulton Sheen said that on the old steering wheels, you know the knobs they used to have? He would use the knobs, right, to count the Hail Marys. We have smooth steering wheels now, but there's a guy in Iowa who's now de de designing rosary steering wheel covers you can put on your car, you know, so kind of interesting, you know. Why not? Sure. We need to get back to this. We really do need to get back to this. Because when times are tough, heaven speaks to us through the rosary. Time and time again. And you know, I, I won't ask you to raise your hand, because I've done that before and people embarrass themselves. Please don't raise your hand. It's a rhetorical question. How many of you have messed up family members? I'm not going to look. <laughs> because you all do. <laughs> okay. I do. Oh, my goodness. Pray for the Callaway family. My mom's a saint, for sure. My dad's on his way, too. But the rest of my family, oh, boy, you know, we got problems. And I'm, myself, I'm still in need of conversion. You know, people read my book and like, oh, Father, you're so great. I'm like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. You know, you see me for a weekend, you think I'm great. Hang out with me for a week, you'll realize, oh, Father needs prayer, <laughs> you know. I got idiosyncrasies, I got weaknesses, and they'll manifest. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I still got issues. We all do. We all do. Most of you probably have a son or a daughter who no longer go to church. They hate the church. They think it's an outdated, antiquated, male-dominated church that won't ordain women, and they're mad, right, or whatever. <laughs> We've all got messed up family members who just, they got issues. They're struggling with addictions of one kind or another or things that maybe they, it's not even within their control. A lot of people today are suffering from serious depression. You know, it, because there's, there's, where's God? And, you know, we kicked him out. This is the way to get things back, my friends. This is the method. Heaven has spoken to us so many times and continues to speak to us about this, the power of this so often and so frequently. Do you want healing in your life? Do you want healing in your marriage? Do you want your children to experience a, a conversion? Don't give up praying this. Will it always be easy? No, it won't. Now, I say this almost making a confession to you, right? I love the rosary. I pray it every day. It's, but there are times when I don't wake up sometimes in the morning and say, yay, I'm going to pray. <laughs> it's tough, and I say that as a priest because it requires sacrifice, right? It requires a commitment. Just like when you got married, you know, it, it, there, the honeymoon lasted a week, two if you were rich, you know. <laughs> And then it was on with the reality of, there's going to be some sacrifice involved. And you can't just abandon ship when things aren't going well. You remember, in good times and in bad, in health and in sickness, when I like you and when I don't like you. When, when you look great and then 40 years later when gravity gets you, you've got to commit. <laughs> gravity gets us all, you know. Fulton Sheen, once again, I love what he says. And by the way, he was so in love with the rosary, he came up with his own version called the World Mission Rosary. Have you ever seen a rosary? Each decade is a different color. You're to be praying that for a different geographical reason of the planet. He's the one who made that, Venerable Fulton Sheen. He's the one who came up with that. But he said that, you know, in marriage there are, there are uh, three rings, right? Have you heard this? I love this. Only Fulton Sheen could say something like this. 
said there's the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffer ring. <laughs> yeah. You know this better than I do, right? But see, we're married to God. All of us in our souls, we're espoused to God. So there's going to be joy. There's going to be the honeymoon. We're going to enter into prayer sometimes, and it's going to be mm, yummy, sugar sweet, really good, honeymoon. But then a lot of times it's not going to be. What are you going to do during that time? Are you going to just put this back on your shelf? Or are you just going to put it away? No. Pray it. Persevere through, through it. It has so much power to, to help you individually and your marriage and your funky children <laughs> and your deceased relatives. You know, there's indulgences that, that are in the big book and the small little one, which I talk about. Because I want to read you a quote from St. Louis de Montfort. And it, it's a stinger, especially for priests. Actually, for priests primarily. He says this, and it, when I first read this, I was like, ouch, St. Louis de Montfort. Ooh, you really got me there. But, but he's right. He's right. He's talking about indulgences. He says about the rosary, people are often quite unaware of how rich the rosary is in indulgences. This is because many priests, when preaching on the rosary, hardly ever mention indulgences and give rather a flowery and popular sermon which incites admiration but scarcely teaches anything. Oh, right? He's right. He's right. You know, every day you can gain a plenary indulgence by praying the rosary. If you've got deceased relatives who you know probably did not die in a very good state or hopefully they're in purgatory, you can be gaining a plenary indulgence every day by praying the rosary for them. See, the, the, the chaplet has promises given from our Lord, but this prayer right here, the rosary, is one of the most indulgence devotional prayers in the history of the church. You can be cleaning out purgatory. Imagine if we were all doing this. We can make such an impact upon purgatory. I know, you know, as I said, I'm no saint. I want to be, but it's a long process. I'm, I'm probably going to be doing some serious purgatory time. I want somebody. Don't forget me. When I die, that's the last thing I want is, oh, Father Calloway's not going to need our prayers. I'm going to be down like, what? Help, you know. Pray, get, get some indulgences. Give me one of those plenary indulgences, you know. Think about uh, St. John Paul II, whom I love and miss so much, right? Think about him. This guy, to me, he was just, he knew what he was doing. For the good of the world, because he was Papa, you know, our father, our spiritual father. But when he, you know, so in love with the Divine Mercy message, even gave the church, outside of the promise that Jesus gave to the chaplet, right, and the, the Divine Mercy celebration on Mercy Sunday. But then, for those who participate in Divine Mercy Sunday, uh, a plenary indulgence as well, in addition to the promise of Jesus. Do you know what John Paul II did? He died, right? On the, after having celebrated the Vigil Mass, the Divine Mercy Sunday, gets the promise and, in a certain sense, the plenary indulgence and walks right into heaven. Brilliant! <laughs> Brilliant! Now, I'm not saying get a plenary indulgence and then walk in front of a bus. That, don't, don't write me up in the Boston Globe. Father says go, you know, no. But take advantage of all the graces that the church gives to you, which you're doing this weekend because you're here for Divine Mercy Sunday. You're going to be given unbelievable graces. But when you leave and you go back to your parish in New Jersey or Pennsylvania or wherever it is, and sometimes you go back to, you, you come here and you meet people of like mind and you see rosary packing Catholics and everybody's like, praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> but then you go back home and it's like everybody's dead. <laughs> Tabernacles down the middle of the hallway. You don't know where Jesus is in your church and stuff, Right. You can make a difference. You really can by praying the rosary. If your parish doesn't pray the rosary, maybe before or after Mass, maybe politely, kindly, and with great humility, ask your pastor if it can be done and start to do it. This book will teach you how. We'll show you how. How to do it right, not fast. Because a lot of times people, when they do it, they're just rocking through that thing, you know, just like slow down. A priest in Ireland who's still alive, I think he's 100 years old, Father Gabriel Hardy, he's called the Rosary Priest of Ireland, he always says, remember what the sign says on the highway. Speed kills. Okay? Don't go so fast. But don't go too slow either. When you pray it in a group, I talk about this in the book. A lot of times why people don't pray the rosary before mass with a certain group, because there's one person that's like, hell, man. It's like, dude, don't be weird, right? Normal, Okay? Because then everybody's focusing on your voice, and nobody, it's, it becomes basically a burden almost. It's like, ugh. Normal breathing patterns, normal, you know. And then 
Have you ever been to a place where you've got like a ton of people praying the rosary as one voice? It's like spiritual thunder. I mean, it really is. And St. Louis Montfort talks about that. He says one person praying the rosary is great, is awesome. But when you get a whole bunch of people praying in it, praying it together, it's like God takes a whole bunch of sticks and puts them together, and Satan can't break it. It's really, really strong. So pray this individually. Pray it in your marriage. Pray it in your parish. Uh, begin to pray it, okay, more than you ever have before. In both the chaplet, the seven sorrows version of the rosary, the, the regular rosary. But don't forget about this, okay? When you go back home, keep it in your pocket. Keep it in your purse and use it. It is a weapon for our times. It is a call from Fatima. It was the weapon St. Faustina herself used. It is the weapon that all saints use. Use it, my friends. Thank you so much. God bless you for coming today.